stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. Joan served the state of California as a member on the Arts Council and on the Film Commission. She was formerly on the Architectural Commission and fulfilled two terms on the Fine Arts Commission for the city of Beverly Hills. As an editor for Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine, Condé Nast Publications, and the Hearst Corporation, Joan covered the world of fashion, the mysteries of food, the excitement of theater, and the international art scene. She continues to find people who are on the cutting edge of their professions. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're taping at that famous Hollywood Museum on Highland Boulevard in Hollywood. And our guests today are composer Daniel Carell and author John Burston. Composer Daniel Carell was born and raised in Alaska and earned his MFA from CalArts. He plays a multitude of instruments, including the accordion. In fact, he's the musical director of the Accordion Orchestra and the musical director of Timur and the Dime Museum. His work has been commissioned and presented by Red Cat, Mocha, The Hammer, and really strange, Pasadena All Saints Church, the USC Thornton School, just to mention a few of the places you've been and the difference between them. Uh, he's the 2014 artist in residence at the Headland Center for the Arts. And Alaska, did you really grow up in Alaska? Yes, I was there. I was born and raised there uh, until I was 18. Went to school down in Washington, and I used to drive back and forth every summer to go back and forth. Were you on the islands? Did you fly on the island? Do you fly everywhere there, or do you well, drive a car? <laughs> we were uh, we were in Anchorage, so we would end up driving most places. A lot of places are accessible by car. It's still quite a ways. Actually, the amount of time you end up driving is comparable to L.A., which is really interesting. Really? Because it's so far? Yeah, because the, the distance is so much greater. But you're driving through more beautiful landscapes. But I we bet. had it, bush <laughs> planes. We did, did end up taking a few of those to get places. So did your musical training come in Alaska? That's where it started, yeah. Were your family, is your family musical? They're kind of musical. I have uncles and everything that play music. My dad plays guitar. My mom actually played recorders. She has a whole set of recorders, which is pretty great. What instruments did you play in Alaska? Well, I, I first started learning piano from uh, my babysitter when I was about five. Uh, and wow. then I started, um, I moved to percussion and studied with a guy, Greg Holloway, who played drums in the Air Force Band up there. And that was really amazing, especially uh, learning to play a bunch of different instruments because percussion is just a bunch of different instruments. So that kind of set me up to learn all these different ones. Do you have to read music to play a percussion? Not necessarily. It depends on what you're doing. If you're playing drum set in a band, you don't necessarily need to read. If you're playing classical percussion, you definitely need to read. And you need to be able to read a bunch of different things. So it's really diverse and a really made it easier to do all these other things. Because they make fun of the percussionists, <laughs> don't they? The, the people in the orchestra always think that they don't have to read, they don't have to know, they're just banging. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. There's different things like there, your ears le learn to listen to different things. You hear rhythms really well, but um, you know a lot of drummers have a harder time hearing pitch because they're so focused on rhythm. Whereas someone uh -huh. like a singer is so focused on pitch, they have uh, more difficulty with rhythm. You just learn things in different ways. But, um, you know, as you get more advanced, all these things start to combine and coalesce. And where did you learn the accordion? <laughs> um, that's actually kind of a funny story. I was visiting my uh, great aunt and uncle in the Philippines. And um, I was down there, and my great uncle, who's this really interesting character who has his whole shelves of knock-knock jokes and stuff. Oh, okay. It's really <laughs> interesting. Um, he had an accordion at his house, and he saw I was into music. And so when I was in high school... Uh, we took the accordion back to Alaska uh, with us. Oh, he had so, the accordion in there? In the Philippines, yeah. So this was an Italian accordion that ha went down to the Philippines and then up to Alaska. So it's been all over the world. And so it was kind of this uh, sort of fluke that I started playing the accordion. So I ended up taking a few lessons up there. And then um, I know I didn't really play it a whole lot in public until I came to California. And um, I started playing music for uh, puppet shows and such, because CalArts oh. has a big puppetry program. And then I met some people um, that are a part of a group called the Accordion Airs, which is a great accordion orchestra in North Hollywood. I've heard of them, yeah. but I didn't know 
how you got to be a musical director. Did oh, you no, put no, together your group. own? Did you put together I, your own the group? The group I have is entirely different. The group I have is called Free Read Conspiracy. Oh, it is yeah. Free Read. Yeah, oh, I got it. Because it's a Free Read instrument, and now uh, the music we, that group focuses on is more experimental, contemporary music. Um, uh, the the accordionaires are really great, and they play a lot more traditional music. And traditional the in just, what way? Folk. Uh, some of it's folk, some of it's classical, um, jazz, um, mm. some tangos, and like um, some show tune type of stuff, uh, film scores. But you don't play that in your... Uh... Not in this group. We haven't yet. Um, and those guys do it so well, and um, it's nice for me to do something that is entirely different. So I played with the accordionaires for a number of years and learned a oh, whole bunch did? of stuff. Oh, you did? You played with them? I played with them, and I learned so much. And um, the larger accordion I have, I bought from one of the members of that group. And the woman... Oh. Janet Haney, who's the director of that group, she's great as well, and they're fantastic. Um, but I got so busy with all these other crazy projects I'm doing to really keep it up. Well, you uh, you said your music is a mix, uh -huh. but when I asked someone else about what do we call Daniel's music, and she <laughs> said experimental, I guess. Oh yeah. And what is experimental? Oh, that's such a broad term these days. It's so hard to say. Some people say experimental if we have. Um, some just someone improvising or making noise. Someone else, another version of experimental music ex uh, embraces lots of silence. Or another version could be someone playing with uh -huh. electronics. Or depends on what your point of reference and what you know. Anything that's outside of what you know, you can consider to be experimental. But there's a whole uh, tradition of experimental music in America, which is, is so many branches of it. So, so different. Would you call yourself classical? Did you train classically? Uh, I did a bit. I have my undergrad major is in percussion, uh -huh. and so I studied classical percussion there, and I studied composition up at CalArts. Um, but the composers I was studying with had that mix of both classical and experimental music. Who were those professors at, at CalArts? The main teachers I had were uh, Anne LeBaron, who's this really, uh, she's great, and she does a lot of opera, and um, she's actually having a big concert at Red Cat next month uh, as like a portrait series. Um, the other main teacher I had was James Tinney, who passed away in about 2006. Oh. And he's a, he is really was steeped in the whole tradition of American classical and experimental music. And, so, and Sabotnik? And Sabotnik. Who was, to me, experimental. I oh, don't yes. know. Was he, he? Would, uh, <laughs> he was, uh, um, by many accounts, you know, uh, one of the forefathers of electronic music. Electronic. And that branch of experimental music. So did you take classes with him, too? I took a few classes with him, yes. And um, I studied with him. He retired after my first year, and I oh. felt like I met this perfect point where all these um, teachers that I really was excited to study with were there throughout this first year, and then... Um, uh, I, um, Tinny passed away and Sobotnik retired and all these other uh, <laughs> teachers left. So it's like, oh, uh, there's all these other amazing people here that I had not um, focused my attention on so much. And I'm glad I did because I got to really s spend that second year studying with Anne. So, so you really did learn a lot. And you just uh -huh. mentioned Red Cat because yeah. one of the things I mentioned earlier was Red Cat, which is uh, the di it's in Disney Hall yep. and it's the CalArts uh, what do we call it, CalArts baby? <laughs> yeah, kind of. They're related. It's kind of made to be sort of a CalArts sort of theater. And so um, the piece that I'm doing... Uh, yeah, tell us about Timur and the Dime Museum. Right. What are you doing? You're, you're directing it? I, you compose the music? I compose the music and wrote the words, and I'm kind of being musical director for it. And I'm playing keyboards, electronics, also ukulele and accordion in this piece. And what is it? What is the piece? How well, long is it, and who's Timur? It's Timur. A, well, uh, Timur, he's a, he's a singer from Kazakhstan. You've actually had him on this show. Before. I have. <laughs> uh, he's, a, he's quite a character, and he's an amazingly talented singer. And the group has been together for a couple years. I've been writing the music for the last few years. Did you start with them? Uh, I mean, yeah. did they start with you? Did you collaborate in the beginning? We did. We started out doing arrangements of other songs, mostly. Oh. Uh, we all knew each other, actually, from CalArts. Uh, I see. And we all met there. We're all uh, alumni of that place. Oh, I see. Where did the name come from? The Dime, Dime Museum? Yeah. Um, well, we were all sitting around trying to think of a clever name, and we were actually just looking online to see what would be a fitting title <laughs> for this. And um, something like a Dime Museum is this uh, sort of antiquated place where people would go, uh, and it's kind of this combination of these uh, 
low arts plus high arts sort of thing. And it fit, at that point, the ensemble was all these acoustic instruments, uh -huh. like banjo, accordion, uh, bass clarinet, and viola, those sort of things. So the name of Dime Museum kind of fit with that sort of aesthetic. So you all decided. Um, is there a story to what goes on, or is it just a musical presentation? Well, there's actually a piece that we're doing. It's called Collapse. Um, uh -huh. We're referring to it as a post-ecological requiem. Uh, every song of it is um, based on a song from a traditional requiem form, oh. but each song is also about a different sort of man-made natural disaster. So it's these explorations of these different things that have been kind of leading to what seems like an imminent collapse of humanity and society and the death of the environment. It's kind of a heavy subject. <laughs> Very heavy. So it makes it hard. So some of the songs end up being satirical or uh, sardonic, but um, some of them are a bit more direct. So it's this big combination. Um, and also the way it relates to a requiem is interesting yeah. in that um, a requiem is usually a pretty morose affair. And you have a heavy thing going anyway, yeah. right? So this one... Um, the approach that I took in it was to kind of celebrate all the different highs and lows that, say, a life might have. So we're saying this is uh, more in line with like a New Orleans, like a sort oh. of parade or party for this is the like a the celebration, end of this thing. sort of a celebration of it. Yeah. So we're taking through all these different uh, emotions and highs and lows in celebration of this thing that is ending or is. And so that's the idea. Before we leave, does does. Um this piece go to other venues? Yes, we're it at does. Red Cat uh, this weekend. Next month, we're taking it to Miami for the Miami Light Project. Oh, great! Which will be—it's uh, a great festival to so have. So you there. all go together? We're all going to go together, and we have a couple collaborators that are coming with us. Jesse Gilbert is an amazing video artist who's doing this live video, which sort of plays off of and interacts with the sound. And um, we have these costumes by Victor Wilde. And this woman who's our producer, Beth Morrison, is doing a great job um, getting everything organized for this. Uh, so then after Miami in May, we are going to go to Rotterdam. So glad you were here before you took <laughs> off. Thank you, yeah, Daniel. Yeah, perfect timing. It was great. And thanks for watching. Don't go away because we're going to have author John Borston on. I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here taping at the historic Hollywood Museum, and we're in the old Max Factor building. I'm with author John Borston, who graduated from Harvard University with a major in Middle Eastern Studies, history, I guess. Um, he was a Harvard Fellowship recipient, and that fellowship took him to Trinity College in Cambridge, England. He also studied at CalArts, which we were just talking about. It's kind of interesting. He was there in the very beginning. But it seems, John, history, fine arts, architecture, peppered your education. When did you start to write? Well, you know, it's one of those things where none of it was preparation and it was all preparation. <laughs> it was you have all to write about something. <laughs> right. You know? So I, I was kind of fascinated by images and I wanted to do something that was both artistic and, and sort of involved science, intellectual. And so I thought architecture would be a good thing, because you have to be an engineer and you have to be an architect, uh, you know, an artist. Uh, so then I discovered I couldn't draw. So Did that was kind of Did you just need out. a ruler? <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays you have a computer, but in those <laughs> days. So I, I spent two years in architecture school. It was a great time. I learned a lot, but I knew I couldn't be an architect. But then I got the movie bug. I fell in love with the movies. And how did that happen? Uh, well, I, you know, how, I mean, you I, weren't I'd from always, here. You weren't from California, I was, I was were you? Sitting in, uh, no, I was from Chicago, and I was sitting in, this was in Cambridge, England. So I found myself going to the movies instead of going to school, and I don't know. <laughs> and then I, I ended up making a documentary. I hitchhiked to Switzerland and bought myself a Bolex from the kind you crank. Yeah. And then I, I made a little right. documentary in Finland about a Finnish pulp mill. So you really were self-motivated to yeah, do that. totally. You I didn't wanted, take any film classes? Part of it was I wanted to do something that didn't involve a lot of education. Or school, I had so school. much schooling on so many things, I thought, this, I want to just figure this out, which is the way the old filmmakers did it. That's why I was drawn to movies. At that point, that was before film schools had sort of had a lock on the thing. And historically, if films were done by people who knew nothing and just sort of 
learn by doing. But you, you said when you started at uh, CalArts, it was like the very beginning. It was in the old campus. Where was that? Downtown LA? No, no that was in Burbank. Oh, in Burbank. in Burbank. And, but there was, but they were teaching film there. They were, but it was a first year it was very anarchic. We kind of voted on what we were going to do. <laughs> and we all voted to sit around a lot and talk. <laughs> so, but what they had was equipment. So I could take, I took a, uh, they had a wonderful Eclair cameras in Nagras, and I took them and I went off to Colorado to do a film. Oh, you which did? I made my little film there with, with their stuff. Um, and that was a great experience too, you know. I, but did you write that? So no, no, was I writing. Wasn't a oh, you yet didn't. At all. I was a filmmaker. I was a visual guy. I started as a still photographer, and uh, I went through a long time as a filmmaker. I made a documentary uh, that was nominated for an Oscar, actually, about the Exploratorium in San Francisco. Oh, the science and art. Yeah, right. Because when I was on the Arts uh, Council, the California Arts Council, we used to fund them. But yeah. it used to be a big debate. Is it science or is it art? And why are the two together? Well, this, this film was uh, probably the only <laughs> film jointly funded by the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Science Foundation. So there you are. Yeah, and, and But were they fighting to see no, who does no, 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 no. I think they were, he was bringing them together. Charles Eames was behind, you know, was the godfather in the whole thing. And this was when the museum was just starting. And we were trying to capture the experience of being in the museum. And um, so... But anyway. it was great. Kids loved going there. Oh, yeah. The experience yeah. was good. Yeah. And, and I think as you become more aware of the arts, you do see where they, they, they really do fit together. Yeah, I mean, Frank Oppenheimer, who ran the thing, said they were both about exploring the limits of human perception. Exactly. So in that, I mean, they had artists in residence who were doing that. And, and uh, some of those things are now in every... Uh, Music, science museum catalog in the world. But you, you talk about being a filmmaker, but you say you weren't writing those things. No, no, I was filmmaking them. I, I directed <laughs> but it. But you I had to write, didn't you, to get the storyline? Uh, well, it has, story no di line. it has no dialogue. It was a documentary. Not storyline, then. But the structure, you had the, the structure. structure. Right. I did, I did what the filmic equivalent of writing. I, I made a... I see. But it's like the character in the book, you know. I, uh, I the purposely... book, let's wait. Mabel and Me, the book, the new book. Yes. This because is a... you've written uh, two other novels. I have. And you wrote... Uh... I wrote a book called Making Movies Work, uh, which is still in print, actually, about uh, how movies have their effect on us. So, so h making movies work would be something that you'd use in a film class? Yes, would, it's used uh, in film students, schools. It's a student... Right, I wrote it originally not for that, but it's been kind of adapted by that. So you how know, did this process on. start? You were making films, then did you write that book on how to make films? Yeah, actually, I think it was a writer's... No, somewhere in there, I was making films, and I was being a producer. I was working with Alan Pakula. I was oh, associate yes. producer on All the President's Men, and we had producing deals, and like, that's uh, like holding a, catching a bowl of steam is what someone described. Okay, there, that deal. takes me back to, are you related to the National Librarian? Yes, he's Daniel my father. Daniel He's my father. That's your father. Yes. Another reason I'm writing fiction instead of nonfiction. <laughs> well, that was quite a somebody to to uh, be in competition with or to follow footsteps in. And I mean, he was yeah, well, I, I, quite you know, a big man. He was. I mean, it's people. He now he's kind of faded, but at the time he was one of the main intellectuals around. And then Pakula. I worked for Alan Pakula, and then he directed a film that I wrote, my first screenplay. I wrote, and uh, Pakula bought it and directed it. And Who was married to it. Hannah Pakula, right. and I went to school with Hannah. Oh, you did? I did. That's why I'm familiar with the Burston oh, name. Oh, oh, oh. So, because well, it was bandied around a lot at Westlake uh, and uh, during the years afterwards, because well, she wrote a book, too. Right. I mean, you know, and my, my niece is Julia Burston, who works for MSNBC as a news, as a uh, financial reporter. So you've gone, you've, yeah. like, gone out. Okay, so maybe it's not so hard Maybe it's not a good question to ask you how you get published because you have your roots out into the publishing no, world. No, I mean, I did, I'm a person who has to do things on their own. And, and basically, <laughs> I, most of my successful things I've done uh, on spec, just sitting down and writing. And then you're stuck with this thing and you have to figure out what to do with it. Yeah, what do you do with so, it? So, right, you find someone who wants want to publish it, which is a long and agonizing process that I won't bore you with, that everyone goes through. But you were drawn to this silent film era. Yes. This yes, is, this why is, were you drawn to that? Well, because I'm still trying to figure out uh, how movies work. And, mm. 
and what they, why they had this power over me, because I'm now at the point where they really sort of have, a, have this hold sway. And I think a lot of people feel that movies have some special, special quality. And I realized that these guys did it for the first time. When they did it, they started with nothing. Okay, so this is Mabel Norman, who was uh, in... Uh, Mabel, yes, Mabel Norman, who is one of the very, who is the first uh, female uh, movie star, com comic movie star. She was this queen of slapstick, uh -huh. and the first woman allowed to be both beautiful and funny. And, she, and it's a novel. It's a novel. Why right. didn't you it's write it? Uh, not a novel. Well, first of all, it's more fun to write it as a novel. It's more interesting <laughs> because the facts are all very vague. One of the other reasons I was drawn to the period is um. there's all these myths about it because everyone's written these. They're sort of self-serving biographies, which are all fascinating because they're great storytellers, but they all conflict with each other. So no, you, some, you, know, you have to sort of pick your truth. And this is perfect ground if you're writing fiction. But the thing is, you have a voice. How do you know what their voice was? I, I mean, I'm going back to silent movies. Yeah. You have a voice. They're kind of like simple. They well, have, I, it's I, simple, isn't it? Well, I, I wrote this uh, in the first person in the voice of a narrator who's 14 years old when the yeah. story starts, who's a guy like me, who, is, who thinks in pictures. He's, he can barely read. And of course, he ends up being a screenwriter, because what else do you do if you yeah. can't read? <laughs> but but uh, before, this is before screenwriters were invented. When, when Max Sennett started hiring screenwriters, which he did sort of a year into this book, uh, he had a rule. No pencil and no paper. You couldn't write anything down. If you wrote it down, it wasn't a movie. Is that right? Yeah. So that's where they were starting from. And that's another reason I love these guys. But you're so literate and you are you the pen to pen to paper kind of I thing. I guess it was and liberate. Here you're dealing it was, that's why I was always drawn to this. That's a good point. I mean, I was always, you know, I, I, yes, I came from a very intellectual environment. And I love the idea of just reacting to pictures and the, the emotion. I mean, Max Sennett said that Mabel on screen was pure emotion. Because she, you couldn't hear her talk. No, right? but also she was just had that gift that movie stars have of just used to being transparent. So she didn't have to talk. No, you and, and because she was, her. and don't forget, in 1912 there were no there were no women lawyers, there were no women doctors. If you had a woman lawyer, it was the subject of a big newspaper article. And so she, you know, she was free in a way women weren't in those eras. I mean, she used to go to go to prize fights and she she ra raced cars, she rode bareback. She, she did all the things that men did and didn't apologize for it. How do you compare it to today's woman? If you wrote a novel today about whoever's in the movies Well, that's movies a good question. <laughs> See, I, I think, I mean, I, she, you know, a lot of uh, candidates for this, but I think that she is a good candidate for the first modern woman. Uh, because what she was doing in 1912 was by night, by, after the First World War in the 20s, that's what flappers did. Uh, they were gay and, and, and sushi. She was called the I Don't Care Girl. So, but so Mabel was doing this in 1912, 10 years before oh, the flappers. Oh, oh, and so all the other women were in their tight dresses with those huge hats, you know, that looked like uh, baskets. Yeah. And uh, Mabel was just, uh, you know, running out there. But you're comparing her to the flappers, but you said she was very slapstick, too. Well, right. I mean, she was a, she a... was the queen of slapstick, right? and she was she was in a <laughs> couple of hundred slapstick movies, uh, but she was also a filmmaker. Don't forget, in those days, the distinctions oh. between things. She was in the first movie where uh, that ever had a, a star's name on it, and her name was in the title called a Mabel's Lovers. So oh, she that's wasn't... how early, that was in 1912. There were other women people just at that time, oh. but. But basically, her life was the whole story of American movies. And she died when silent movies died in the late 20s. Uh, she was 37 years old. Oh, but in wow. that period, she lived the whole story of American movies. How did you find out all of this information about her? Well, uh, uh, there's a very good biography about her by Betty Fussell. Fussell. Um, but, uh, and also, you know, you read about her, she affected people. Were there Just, newspaper articles? I was doing research because I was supposed to be uh, putting together a kind of history of the movies for um, the Academy. You know, they're building this museum and I was drafted to do a very early version of the story of the movies for that. And so I got involved in reading these things about the early days and, and uh, her name popped up. And then I saw this, her life and how it affected people like Sam Goldwyn and uh, Charlie Chaplin. She directed Charlie Chaplin in his first movie as the Tramp. 
Oh, she did? Yes. So she knew about film. She knew about film when Chaplin didn't. Chaplin was a newcomer coming off, coming out of, and he was, of course, bra oh, brash right. and yeah. full of beans and thought he knew everything and didn't know anything about movies. And so she taught him about the movies and sort of freed him up also to be himself on screen. Um, and so this 14-year-old takes us all through, yeah. starting with the bag of donuts and ending with the bag of donuts, right? Yes, right, right, right. <laughs> Don't give away the ending, right? No, I'm just saying no, it starts know, with donuts and ends you. with donuts. And who's your publisher? Uh, Angel City Press. This is their first novel. They've published a lot of books about Southern California. Very much uh, about yeah. the arts yes. and about individuals. And right. this, that's why I was wondering why you didn't uh, write it as a, as a nonfiction. Well, I had written it by the time I went to them, you know, and they were oh. very helpful with the editing process. But I, I had a manuscript, as, as I always do with these things, with all my books, I've written them on, you know, for myself, and then I've tried to place them. Oh, fantastic. And I've been pretty lucky with that. Well, it's really fast reading and really well, fascinating. And I'm so glad, John, that you came to be with us. Well, thank you. I mean, I'm in love with the movies. I'm in love with Mabel, <laughs> and I'm glad I could share my passion with all, all of you. And we want them all to love you, too. <laughs> Keep writing, Love Jay. Mabel. You can, <laughs> love see her Mabel. On, you can see her on YouTube, by the way. Love Mabel. Yeah, write to me at Email J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 at AOL.com. We'll see you next time.